This is a real-life asteroid impact crater, made not up in space, but rather down here on Earth, at the Texas A&M University, where we find a projectile much like this one at 5.5 kilometers per second, smashed into the target, vaporizing itself, and causing this rather massive hole. Of course, this does remind us that astronauts need some pretty insane protection of their own in order to keep them safe. And today, we're going to find out how that was developed. You're in for a pretty awesome episode. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the platform for making beautiful, functional websites. Before we go smashing our own very fast projectiles, why are we doing this in the first place? These are NASA astronauts Barry Wilmore and Terry Virts during US EVA 30, where they were packing up a glass fiber blanket that had been installed over pressurized mating adapter number two on the International Space Station. Previously used by the shuttle, when that was cancelled, the cover was put into place until the port could be recommissioned for use by the SpaceX Dragon capsule. Eventually, one of these SpaceX missions brought the cover back to Earth, where today it's being housed inside Space Center Houston. If you look really closely, you can see that the surface is peppered in tiny holes, confirmed by chemical analysis to be from submillimeter sized micrometeorites and fragments of space junk, traveling at between 4 and 12 kilometers per second. Slightly larger pieces have temporarily disabled satellites and cracked station windows. This means that our engineers are constantly trying to find better forms of shielding. Let's leave the museum and head to the front lines of this invisible battle. To create the next generation of shields, we need to really understand the underlying physics, which is what brings me to the Texas A&M Hypervelocity Impact Lab, located in the Center for Infrastructure Renewal on the RELUS campus. Pride of place is, of course, the 13.7 meter long aeroballistic range. This thing can reliably shoot projectiles at up to eight kilometers per second. For reference, that's about 11 times faster than a speeding bullet and 2.5 times that of the Navy's experimental railgun. Entirely by coincidence, exactly downrange from the gun is the home stadium of the Texas Longhorns. Our projectile can make the trip to Austin in about 15 seconds. All guns operate with the same basic principle, with an expanding cloud of high-pressure gas pushing a projectile along for the ride. However, this one has a few extra modifications to make that projectile much faster. The rate of a gas's expansion depends on Newton's famous force equals mass times acceleration, where we get the most rapid expansion if we use a light gas under very high pressure. To maximize the force term, we use a smokeless gunpowder repellent to produce lots and lots of nitrogen gas and carbon dioxide. An igniter sets off a 2 gram primary charge, which simultaneously ignites a 300 gram secondary charge to produce 2,500 bar of pressure. These exhaust gases are pretty heavy, which means that their expansion is slow and maximum speed gets capped out at about 1 km per second. The lightest gas is hydrogen. It could expand and accelerate really quickly, but only if we're able to get it to a high enough starting pressure. With this equipment, we get that by using two stages. First, the gunpowder accelerates a piston down the pump tube, ahead of which is a lot of hydrogen gas kept in place at the central breach by a steel disc. The piston compresses our hydrogen until its pressure is so high that the disc bursts. Released from its high pressure confinement, the super light hydrogen accelerates itself and a conveniently placed projectile at 3 million Gs down the launch tube. Meanwhile, the piston gets caught at the central breach where it can be extremely annoying to remove. Downrange from the gun, we enter the first of two large tanks. This one is typically filled with low pressure nitrogen. If we're using a sabo as a hold shot type propellant, then the small amount of aerodynamic forces will rip apart the container, allowing the projectile and nothing else to continue forward. The end tank is where we install our sample. Today, this 15 by 15 by 1 centimeter piece of high density polyethylene. We keep the tank at a vacuum to better represent the conditions of outer space. If we add a bit of air back in, then this represents the upper atmosphere. Add in too much, then our projectile turns into a shooting star. We're going to see what's going on by using a 1 million frame per second high speed camera, illuminated by a panel of ultra bright LEDs. These noodly appendages are x-ray tubes linked to a bank of capacitors. 
They could allow us to see what's going on inside the target during the collision, but for today, they're a little bit overkill. Laser gates measure the time it takes for the projectile to move a known distance, and extrapolates this velocity forward, starting the camera to record just as the projectile is expected to enter its field of view. The team seals up the container, pumps out the gas, and we're ready for our test. Charging up. Firing in three. Two, one. We hit the target at precisely 6.50098 kilometers per second, releasing 63,394 joules of energy, and making this the most energetic collision yet achieved in the facility. Two, one. As the projectile impacts our target, we see a bright flash as the outer layers vaporize and resulting gases incandesce. On the front face, ejector are launched backward, while on the back, debris are strewn forward. Even our bank of ultra-bright LEDs aren't enough to illuminate this cloud, so dense is the amount of material being spewed out. Eventually, it disperses enough to reveal its fine structure, but just as our view gets interesting, the camera runs out of memory and the recording ends. The A&M Hypervelocity Impact Lab has today conducted more than 300 tests, which they've used to develop new forms of spacecraft shielding. To show you how that's done, I've set up a projector with some of my favorite shots. You might expect that harder materials are going to give us better impact protection, but as this test with high-density polyethylene versus ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene is about to show, things are a bit more complicated. Both have the same density, but ultra-high molecular weight is comprised of longer chains. At slow speeds below about one kilometer per second, this gives ultra-high molecular weight the better impact resistance, because these chains stick together more effectively than the shorter ones of HDPE. Repeating the experiment again, but this time at five kilometers per second, we get this. Although the debris clouds are slightly different, because these are literally different materials with different failure mechanisms, their general shape and mass loss is almost identical. That's really important, because it means that when you have very high-speed collisions, it's not the material hardness or strength that matters, but rather its density. If we'd used a denser material, it would take physically more energy to move the molecules away. That is a big problem for spacecraft travel, because it means we need to send up really heavy shielding, which takes away mass which would better be put to other uses. One idea is to spread the original impact over a very large area, so that no one region experiences a devastating amount of energy. Developed in 1947 by Harvard astronomer Fred Whipple, this is the Whipple Shield. A bumper plate breaks up the projectile into an expanding cloud of debris, which is spread over a large region of wall. It works even better if you're able to add in a second plate behind the first. In this test, we get a bright blue flash from the vaporized aluminium outer layer, followed by a red as we burn the second layer made of ceramic. A good Whipple shield will half your mass requirements, but does so at the expense of a lot of volume. In many ways, this can be just as bad. Fortunately, an ongoing research project shows some promise. The idea for the new shield comes from this test, where a projectile hits an inclined piece of carbon fiber. Rather than going straight through as you might expect, instead the debris come off at right angles to the plate. That's really important, because it means that if we keep adding in more and more of these sheets, then effectively we can turn the debris right back around. Using a honeycomb structure, we're able to get all of the required angles, while simultaneously achieving enough structural integrity to replace the station's original pressurized hull. Overall, saving significantly on mass and volume. When put into practice, this means that our next generation of space stations will be able to dedicate more resources toward useful payload, while simultaneously being even safer for astronauts. As we're able to test an ever-increasing range of target materials, projectiles, and impact velocities, we're able to develop a much better understanding of the underlying physics. As we do, we're able to make this final frontier just a little bit more safe or at least to better characterize the dangers we're going to face as we explore beyond our own Earth. 
Until next time, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. Ahoy there! It is I, Captain Sailout, on our first ever adventure to discover the mysterious land of Squarespace. As a pirate captain, I need a website to proclaim my adventures, but at the same time, don't want to spend the same amount of time building the website as I do on those adventures. Fortunately, Squarespace has me covered. With dozens of templates, a nice drag and drop feature, and thousands of free and premium stock photographs, you'll have a beautiful website up and running in no time. Once you've done that, why not branch out with some private members-only pages for some exclusive pirate booty? Or send out an email campaign to bring more adventurers in for the quest. When you're ready to set sail, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. Or if you want a 10% discount on the paid version, squarespace.com slash atomicfrontier will give you 10% off. Happy sailing.